Just one second. Paul, can you just confirm that you can see my uh, slides okay? Paul, can you, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you and I can see your slides. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you. So before I go into the uh, presentation proper, I uh, just want to give you a bit of a contest, contest, uh, context. Sorry. Um, so first of all, I've got vested interest in the um, in this topic uh, because I uh, been living with a chronic condition, namely HIV, for the last twenty two years. And secondly, when I came across spiritism um, about five years ago, the thing that uh, blew my mind, um, you know, to, to begin with, was this idea of illness as a dispreferred indifference. And um, this idea that for the Stoics, uh, illness is just an indifferent, um, a dispreferred indifference, it's a bit of a technical term, but it basically means that it doesn't matter that much. Uh, what really matters for the Stoics is virtue, uh, being a good person, being the best you can be. And for me, this idea um, coming from Italy where we've got this expression, um, I don't know whether it's used elsewhere, but in Italy, when somebody's going through a difficult patch, uh, you would try and cheat them up by saying, uh, oh, mm, it's okay, you know, as long as you're healthy, you're fine. And so that really gives you the idea that according to the saying that health is the best you can have. Um, and so the corollary, corollary to that is that, you know, if you're, um, if you're sick or you're ill or you've got a chronic condition, obviously, um, you know, it's not very good. Um, and here stoicism was telling me that illness was an indifferent and that what matter was, uh, you know, the um, trying to pursue virtue. And I found this, this uh, the very idea very empowering, uh, very liberating because um, virtue was very much uh, within my reach, whereas in, uh, health uh, was not anymore. So this is the um, context that I wanted to give you before I give you a quick overview of the uh, presentation. So I'd like to start what, uh, with what I call it um, almost ironically and certainly controversially, controversially a philosophy of resilience. A lot of people think that, uh, especially people who don't know much about stoicism, that stoicism is all about you know, being resilient, being uh, strong and um, in the face of adversities. Um, whereas we know that stoicism is a lot more than that. And this is why I wanted to end the presentation with uh, what I call the philosophy of love, uh, because stoicism um, is also a philosophy of love. There's a, a big sort of element in stoicism which points to the uh, pro-social uh, nature of human beings. So I would like to stress that also because I think it's, uh, it can be Counterproductive if you if you're in a difficult situation like a chronic condition and you um, fixate too much on it and you become too inward looking rather than be more outward looking uh, looking also at the, the, the way that you can be a benefit to your community and to your uh, to the society at large. We're obviously going to talk about illness as an indifferent as the main topic. Um, I should have said that uh, more or less, uh, but this, you know, a lot of the quotes can be applicable also if you find yourself, if you have experienced, you know, a major sort of crisis in your life. It doesn't have to be an illness. Um, 
well, um, so this, you know, this whole thing applies, except obviously we're going to talk about illness and death and uh, as an indifferent and shortness of life as an indifferent, death and shortness of life are two topics which are very much um, relevant for uh, somebody who lives with a chronic condition. And the reason being that uh, I find that if you're, if you're living with a chronic condition, you, you've got a heightened sense of your mortality and the, the, this idea that life is transient. Uh, and finally, before ending with this uh, philosophy of love, we're going to talk about post-traumatic growth, which is a beautiful concept, which kind of diverts the attention from the, you know, the, um, the crisis, from the trauma, from this difficult situation that you're experiencing to what comes after, which is generally uh, sort of a rebirth, um, a possibility to grow, um, you know, personal uh, growth. Uh, the the um, what you know, popularly we we would refer to as the silver lining. Okay, so you may be uh, uh, familiar with this quote, uh, which is very famous by Epictetus, uh, that says, "People are not upset by things." but by the judgment they have about things. It's a central idea in stoicism, and it's this idea that uh, when you're upset by things, when you have this uh, you know, uh, negative um, sort of emotions, uh, that's because, because of the judgments that you have on these things. Uh, the, uh, the Stoics believe very much that there's a difference between things that we can control and things we can't control. And, they thought that it's not the external circumstances that matter, like, for example, an illness or the fact that you're poor or, or some other uh, problems that you may be experiencing, but the way that you, uh, but, but the way that you respond to these circumstances and the, the judgment that we have about this. Here's another famous quote by Marcus Aurelius in the Meditations. As he says, this is not a misfortune, but to bear it nobly is good fortune. So um, assuming that Marcus is referring here to an illness, uh, he's saying, you know, that this illness is not a misfortune. It's not something bad, but rather to bear it nobly is good fortune. Rather, the, the way that you respond to it, whether you're able to respond to it with, you know, a great uh, spirit of resilience, with patience, with dignity, that will, that's what really matters, not the circumstances per se. Again, the locus of control is internal, not external. What matters is how you view things and how you, um, and how you behave, but not the uh, external things themselves. This is from Seneca, another famous, um, I should say, for those of you who don't know, Marcus Aurelius is a, a Roman emperor and he wrote the Meditations, which is a, a, a diary. And this is Seneca, another famous Stoic. Um, he was uh, the advisor to Nero. He's also a, a playwright. He wrote uh, loads of beautiful letters, which I recommend, and also some essays. This is one, it's called Of Anger. And Ovanga specifically shows what a fine psychologist the Stoics were. So I highly recommend it that, uh, you to read the uh, of anger. Seneca says here, suppose that the thing, uh, and he refers to the thing that angers you, things that makes you mad, is a disease or a misfortune. It will take less effect upon you if you bear it quietly. Um, what Seneca is saying here is uh, it's going to be no use if you get mad at this condition of yours and you say stuff like, you know, I can't bear it, this is too much, why me? But rather, if you bear it quietly, and if you try and minimize it anyway, that, that's going to be helpful. Uh, this is very much um, uh, it reminds me of the um, what's called the uh, metaphor of the two arrow, arrows. I don't know whether you're familiar with it. I think it's a Buddhist thing. And so the idea is that when you have, um, you know, a physical disease or pain, that would be the first arrow. Uh, pain is inevitable. 
The second error, which is um, that you can um, you can avoid, uh, and it's optional, is suffering. And it's basically all the narrative that follows the uh, the assessment of the situation. You know, saying, you know, this is too much. I can't bear it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this quote is quite long, so I'm not going to read it, but I would like to highlight three different points. One is a, kind of the same concept. As a Seneca on the healing power of the mind says, pain is like if, if opinion has added nothing to it. So the Stoics are very much fond of uh, just trying to assess um, a situation in the light pool of reason, as it were, without adding a valid judgment on top of it. So say you got a pain, um, you know, you, you realize, you make the assessment, you got this pain. Uh, if you then add a value judgment like, you know, this is too much, when is this gonna end, why me? Then you may make it worse. Uh, he also says, it is nothing, a trusting matter at most, keep a stout heart and it will soon cease. Again, it's um, this idea that you can try and minimize it and play down the importance of this thing. This incidentally reminds us of the, uh, that mantra by Epictetus. Um, Epictetus used to say to his students, um, say to your, um, to, to your false impressions or to everything that's not under your control, this is nothing to me. So there's an echo of Epictetus there. Finally, a man is as wretched as he has convinced himself that he is. Again, this idea that the, it's, you know, it's very much, uh, it's about the power of the mind. You know, the letter itself is called on the healing power of the mind. And it's this the way, this idea that by, you can help yourself by framing things in the right uh, way. There's another quote by Marcus Aurelius that says, um, life is what your thoughts make it. In this passage here, Seneca is pointing to a specific strategy that we can adopt when faced with a pain, or perhaps, uh, you know, when we, you know, down in the dumps, we're feeling down. Um, we can try and distract ourselves by bringing our mind to something honorable or brave that we've done in the past. They use it as like a distraction technique, if you like, in order to cheer ourselves up. And I remember that my mom used to say when she was uh, uh, suffering from cancer the last few years of her life, and she used to say to me that the times when she wasn't uh, aware of the pain was when she got distracted because she was, you know, doing something. She was involved in some sort of activity. <clears throat> now let's talk about illness as an indifferent. Uh, this, let me think if this, this one, that, that goes my leg. Gone. So that goes my leg. It requires little explanation. So it's a phrase which I've kind of coined, but it's I've adapted from a phrase used by Massimo uh, Pigucci. He wrote an article where he came up with a series of short uh, sentences um, where he sort of refers to a more complex, uh, you know, idea from the uh, from the literature, from the Stoic literature. For example, he uses the phrase, that goes my cup. This is, uh, this is the, um, where this, that goes my leg come from. And that goes my cup, it refers to a passage in Epictetus where Epictetus is encouraging his students to think about the uh, fragility of life uh, by thinking about the essence of things. So if you got a cup, a ceramic cup, think about the fact that the, this cup is made of ceramic and therefore breakable. Um, if you think about, um, a loved one, you can think that they're mortal and therefore they bound to die sooner or later. Okay, so the next quote is, um, is from the discourses this time, uh, Epictetus, and it's a passage that's got some sort of, uh, I find some Buddhist overtones. Um, so Epidate is saying here that we should try and detach ourselves from the thing that uh, we, we love in a way. 
uh, from the thing that we possess, like it could be a dog or a horse or a piece of land, but even uh, our own body or our own body parts. That's how radical this is. And, and even uh, people that you're related to and then you love. And only by creating this detachment, then you're not gonna be so much in pain when it comes to be torn away from you, from, uh, from yeah, when you're uh, basically, uh, when it's time to say goodbye to them. Uh, here is the, uh, Exit is talking about the, um, the cult, what we refer to as the dichotomy of control, a central idea in Stoicism. Um, which basically says that you need to always make an assessment and decide whether something is in control, in your, under your control, or is not under uh, your control. And things like illness, uh, or death, or poverty, education, social status, those are all things which are deemed external and therefore not under our control. The only thing that is under our control for the Stoic is really our mind, if you like, is our faculty of choice, our faculty of reason, our ability to, to reason and decide, uh, you know, what's the right way to, to act. Um, and Epitetus says that we should always bear in mind this difference. And if we ever misguidedly think that things like an illness, for example, is under our control, then we're bound for disappointment. Uh, kind of the same idea here. Um, Epitator says that disease is an impediment to the body. Uh, you may not be able to do things that you know uh, able-bodied people can do, but it's not an impediment to choice. Choice is a technical term, and it means uh, it refers to the faculty of reason, faculty of choice that I've um, just referred to a minute ago. Lameness is an impediment to the leg. You may not be able to walk as fast. Uh, but it's not an impediment to choice, it's not an impediment to your ability to reason, to your ability to pursue virtue, which again is the most important thing for a stoic, to live eudaimonically, uh, to live according to virtue, to live according to reason. I'm aware that I'm, you know, I'm using technical term, terms every now and again, but hopefully in the QA, if uh, Something is not clear, you can, you can ask me. Now, this requires a little explanation. This is uh, a, um, Epitatus, uh, the slave philosopher. I should, should have said that uh, uh, Epitatus was uh, a slave and then he became a philosopher and then he became a successful philosophy teacher. I told you so, it refers to an episode, to an anecdote rather. Uh, apparently, Epictetus, when he was still under his first owner, Epictetus incidentally means acquired. Uh, when he was uh, under his first uh, master, under his first owner, uh, his first uh, owner was beating him on the leg so hard that Epictetus said to his master, if you keep doing this, you're going to break my leg. And the master eventually did break his leg, uh, Epictetus' uh, leg. And Epitator turns around and says, I told you so. And I love this uh, anecdote because to me, it kind of uh, symbolizes two um, quintessential, if you like, um, elements of the philosophy. On one side, we see quite a bit of irony. And uh, surprisingly so, at least for people who don't know much about Stoicism, who think that it's a dull philosophy, it's a dry. Uh, but I do find that there's the pockets of irony even there in the, um, uh, every now and again in the, uh, in the Stoic literature. And the second element that I would highlight is this, uh, it, it is the strong spirit of resilience, of almost defiance in the face of adversity. Um, you know, it, it, the epitatus makes light of the, the breaking of this leg, uh, and it just, you know, jokes about it. He says, I told you so. And I guess you can understand why he's able to do that because Epitatus would think that the most important thing in life is not an illness, it's not a disability, but rather a, our ability to pursue virtue, to, to choose the right course of action. 
uh, the, uh, the the master uh, breaking his leg or beating him up uh, was not under his control. What is under his control is the way that we respond to it, and he decides to respond with with um, with defiance and with a strong sense of resilience and with a lot of dignity. I should say, I should add. So death is an indifferent. Uh, again, death is as an indifferent. Uh, it's something that. Uh, doesn't matter much, it's a dispreferred indifferent. The subtitles also requires a little explanation and it refers to a, um, another episode uh, where this, um, um, it was a statesman, I don't think he was a senator, yeah, Agrippina's uh, statesman, a Roman statesman. He was informed by a messenger, messenger that he was being tried in the Senate. And so Agrippin says to the, uh, to the messenger, well, are they sentencing me to die? If they sentencing me to die now, then I'm gonna die now. Uh, if not now, then I'm gonna have lunch now because it's time for, for lunch. Uh, and again, like with the, uh, as in the Epitatus' anecdote, uh, I find that, you know, but we, we find again, you know, the use of irony and the use of uh, this idea that, you know, this strong sense of uh, um, courage uh, in, in the face of advers adversities. Um, yeah, again, we read the territory of the uh, dichotomy of control here. It data says that, you know, there's no way that you can escape death because death is inevitable. So that's not that's beyond your control. But what you can do, what it is, what is under your control, is how you respond to that, and whether you're able to assuage your fear of that. As you know, you can even prepare yourself for that. We know that the um, Stoics used to use um, use this uh, negative visualization, which is a, a meditative practice, in order to psych yourself up for. Um, negative um, uh, occurrences in, in the future. Along the same line is this quote from Marcus Aurelius. It says, a man should not fear death, but rather should fear never beginning to leave. Uh, so they should fear uh, never uh, putting their lives to any good use, as it were. Because with the Stoics, the length of life didn't matter. It matter whether you know you lead a, a life, um, a good life, a life of virtue. Uh, I find that the uh, at least the, the last sentence here again, we there's a touch of irony there. And so Seneca is saying in one of his letters called "On Despising Death." Uh, presumably he's talking to Lucilius or some, somebody else, I can't remember, he's saying, well, you shouldn't be afraid that you're going to die. If anything, you should be afraid that, um, if anything, uh, a thing, ponder for a second that you, if you die, you will uh, cease to run the risk of getting imprisoned. You will cease to run the risk of, um, of getting sick. You will cease to run the risk of death, obviously. Shortness of life, um, again, for the Stoics, is that, you know, whether you live a long life or a short life, it doesn't matter. It matters whether you make good use of it. I'm kissing a mortal refers to the, that passage I quoted, um, I referred to earlier, rather, and here you can find it in its entirety. So this idea that whenever we, um, we got something that we love, we should, I remind ourselves of the uh, the essence of this thing. So if it's a China, uh, to remind ourselves that it's breakable. If it's uh, um, a loved one, to remind, to remind ourselves that they're mortal and hence they could die. And, and he, uh, he ends by saying, then you won't be so distraught if they're taken from you. Now, this is interesting. I just want to spend a couple of seconds on this last sentence because I've seen a lot of um, times on the internet that this is translated as, then you won't be distraught if they're taken from you. 
uh, which is obviously quite controversial. It gives you the idea when you translate it like that, that you're not going to be distraught at all if, you, you know, if your spouse or your child dies. Uh, but this translation, which I have here, it's different and it makes a lot of sense to me. But I don't know where I got it from. Then you won't be so distraught if they're taking from you. Of course, if you, you know, if you knew all along that you know people are bound to die, uh, that you know uh, even kids die, then you won't be so distraught. This is what I was referring to earlier. Um, Seneca is saying here, like uh, Marcus uh, earlier, that um, sometimes uh, people have lived a long life, but they have lived too little. So. They had a kind of an existence rather than a proper, they existed rather than uh, living. And the second part of the quote is a, if you like, it's a, it's a negative visualization right there. It's uh, quite radical at that, in the sense that uh, Seneca is reminding himself that death can be literally around the corner. It can be, lit it can be literally a few hours away. Uh, so it's not visualizing yourself that you're going to die perhaps in 10 years time, but rather, you know, visualizing yourself that, visualizing that you may die just a few hours away. So he's saying, if you want, when you go out of the house, uh, remind yourself that you may not come back again. When you go to sleep, remind yourself that you may not wake up again. Memento mori, it's a Latin phrase that means remember that you must die. And it's, uh, again, this is the topic of this, this idea of the uh, fragility of life, the transiency of life that's very, that was very dear to the uh, Stoics. And you may know this quote, very famous. I love this quote because it's very, it's full of meaning in it uh, and, and yet very, very simple. Uh, sometimes in stoicism we get lost uh, with all the uh, technical jargon, uh, and here this this, this quote uh, encapsulates the, the the whole philosophy. I find so Marcus is really saying here: uh, first of all, don't waste time because life can be short. Again, uh, and above all, don't waste time uh, doing things, uh, silly things, or just talking about things, just philosophizing or discussing even what a good man is, a good person is, but rather try to be a good person, act rather than talk. Uh, it brings to mind uh, a metaphor that Epictetus used to, um, that used a lot in his, in his discourses, this, um, uh, this idea that we need to consider ourselves like some kind of Olympic athlete, which are, who are training for the Olympics. So serious business. And talking a serious bit, uh, business, um, this is Britney Spears. Um, one day I was um, I was listening to a song by uh, Britney Spears, and yes, I do like Britney. And the song is called "Do Something." Um, the Britney is in a, on the disco floor. She's throwing a few moves, and this uh, fella is uh, gawking at her. And Britney Spears says in the song says, you know, um, why don't you do something? Well, you know, why, why just stand there, do something? And I thought that this, that, you know, this uh, lyrics uh, immediately brought to mind is the famous quote by Marcus Aurelius, because uh, I, I find that there was the same sort of call to action, same sort of urgency that we find in Marcus Aurelius. So I thought I would mix the uh, sacred and the uh, profane. Post-traumatic growth. Uh, so the uh, subtitle uh, reads, I made a prosperous voyage when I suffered shipwreck. And these words were uh, apparently uttered by Zeno, Zeno of Citium, uh, who was the founder of Stoicism. Uh, but before became, becoming a, um, a philosophy teacher, uh, Zeno was a, uh, a wealthy merchant. And one day he got shipwrecked and he landed in Athens. So he lost all his possessions. He was literally destitute. Uh, he walked into a bookshop and started learning about philosophy. 
uh, following different sort of schools of thought until he actually founded the, um, the uh, Stoic school and he became a famous um, philosophy teacher. And so this idea again, that sometimes has a silver lining and that, uh, you know, we, after we've gone through some major crisis, we, you know, we, that that's, that's a new phase in our life where we can actually grow and something good happens. A concept that's beautifully expressed here by Masonius Rufus, who incidentally was Epictetus's philosophy teacher, because we humans acquire all good things by pain. Uh, I'm not going to read the rest of it. The concept is quite clear. Uh, it's the idea of no pain, no gain. Uh, most of the time, a lot of the good stuff come from a period of um, pain and suffering. The same idea of post-traumatic growth is expressed here, is conveyed through a beautiful metaphor. And I should point to the fact that, you know, a lot of people like Stoicism, uh, not only because of the, uh, you know, the nice concept, the nice philosophical concept, but also because of the li literature, you get to appreciate and enjoy, uh, you know, perhaps a nice turn of phrase or perhaps a nice metaphor like is the case here with Seneca. And Seneca says uh, in the uh, essay called On Providence, um, that the strongest trees are the ones which are um, being assailed by wind and beaten by adverse weather, whereas the weakest ones are the ones which are grown in a sunny, a sunny valley. Hercules was a role model for the Stoics. Uh, he was this uh, epitome of uh, resilience and strength. And Epitator saying here that Epitatus wouldn't have been, uh, but sorry, uh, Hercules wouldn't have been Hercules if he hadn't been through all these challenges that he had been through. So those challenges made Hercules uh, who he was, a strong person, uh, full of uh, resilience and endurance that he was. So more silliness here. You may not recognize this, but this is Hercules. Uh, it's only a small statue, about 30 centimeters long. And uh, you may know perhaps the uh, statue that's housed in the, that room, which is much more famous than this one, which is housed in the Archaeological Museum of Naples. Uh, that one is about three meters long and it shows Hercules in just a usual pose, you know, majestic, sort of um, imposing physical presence, etc. Whereas this one, uh, there's a lack of composure here. It's clearly intoxicated. It's uh, been having a few Hercules. Uh, and it's called the statue of the drunken Hercules. And you can find it in Herculaneum. Why am I putting it here? Just uh, purely because, um, you know, the uh, stoicism sets the bar quite high. Uh, it demands of us that a lot of uh, discipline as well. And uh, that we should keep the eyes firmly on the prize, which is virtue. Uh, but uh, I do find, personally, I don't know if you will agree that you, you know, every now and again, you, you need to um, let your hair down. And I guess that's what Hercules was doing in between a challenge and the next. Now, this, um, you, you can find, you can see the, the uh, Greek phrase there, with, and the translation is next to it. It means uh, only what is honorable is good, or in other words, virtue is the only good, uh, which is with a mantra for the Stoics. Uh, the, only, uh, the most important thing in life is virtue, is the supreme good. And I find that the word kalon, Greek word uh, kalon, very interesting and intriguing because apparently it um, meant not only uh, honorable, but also beautiful. So virtue is something that is honorable, but also beautiful, at least, you know, an internal beauty, if you like. Uh, Seneca highlights this aspect of stoicism that we shouldn't uh, ignore. And it's this idea that, uh, you know, that, that, that is a strong, as I said earlier, a pro-social element to the uh, philosophy. Um, it says, no school of philosophy is more gentle and benignant. None is more full of love towards men or more anxious to promote the happiness of all 
saying that its maxims are to be a service and assistance to others and to consult the interests of each and all, not of itself alone. And hopefully you still with me. This is the um, last quote. I'm going to read it all, also because I, I, I like it a lot, and I'm going to dedicate it to all the people who live with a chronic condition. So, do you think that you're doing nothing if you possess self-control in your illness? You will be showing that the disease can be overcome or at any rate endured. The reason I show you a place of virtue even upon a bad sickness. It is not only the sword and the battle line that prove the soul alert and unconquered by fear. A man can display bravery even when wrapped in his bad clothes. You have something to do, wrestle bravely with disease. Oh, what ample matter were there for renown if we could have spectators of our sickness. Be your own spectator, seek your own applause. That is it. May you wrestle bravely with disease. And thank you very much for listening. And I've, um, this, uh, I'll put it in the chat box, but this is a couple of articles I wrote for the Modern Stoicism blog, and also a podcast I took part in, and it's all about the same topic of Stoicism and illness. And if you want to interact with me, that's my email address, and that's my Twitter, although I can just uh, basically um, start with uh, tweeting. Um, uh, but if you want to use my email, if you want to give me uh, feedback on this presentation and let me know whether you think you found that there was something missing, or there's any way that I could make it better, that would uh, be highly appreciated. Thank you. I've hopefully it wasn't too long. I think I've uh, 10, 50, yeah, about 40 minutes. Sorry, five minutes more than I intended. You're still recording, Carmelo. Yeah, but I was thinking that it would be useful to have the uh, Q&A on the uh, recording, uh, if people don't mind. So, um, I mean, we, we've got two hours until six, but obviously if we run out of, uh, out of steam, we would we just, you know, call it a day. But if there's anyone who wanted to make any comments, um, please feel free to do so. Uh, I can't see any, hardly anyone who disappeared. <laughs> Terry. Yeah, do you want to, yeah, so if, whenever you want to talk, please unmute yourself and then re-mute yourself. Okay. Um, I see Rose is putting her hand up. She's not quite oh, cool. a hand idea, I think. Um, yeah, just on the cup thing, I, I think I know most of the modern writers um, pull back from that, pull back from taking the full implications of breaking being the same as losing your wife, for instance. I think that's a mistake. It's a mistake because, especially the Epictetus, it's intended to be provocative. And the things are written to be as provocative as, as possible. That's why you are to think about this at the same time as kissing your child or wife or partner. So you couldn't put it any more provocative than that. So then the question is, why does uh, Epictetus do that? And I think when you take this on board, it causes you to do something differently that you wouldn't otherwise. So you make it too easy for people. It's not going to change people's mind or even their thinking. So it seems to me that what happens when you eventually understand this thing, and I have to tell you, it took me a few goes from starting reading Epictetus to actually come to grips with this because at first you want to reject it. So, but it causes you to have a different mental outlook. So it doesn't cause you to be more callous or indifferent. It causes you to do exactly the opposite. It causes you to cherish those things and people who are important to you while you can. So that's the thrust of it, and that's the purpose of it, it seems to me, to change your mental outlook. 
Yeah, you you're saying that it's almost a, a, a rhetorical uh, uh, technique that he uses. He wants to be that extreme because he's trying to provoke you into thinking something. I mean, I agree with you. I that that because the as soon as you understand that your that your loved ones are perishable, by <laughs> lack of a better word, then you you know that you know your this time on earth can be limited, and then you make the try and make the most of it. So it's not. I don't find it callous, but there's some people who uh, find it so. It just just on that, it, there's someone else who says things about completing each day, isn't there? You know, not letting things carry over from day to day, problems or fights or whatever that you have with people. And that's another um, sort of benefit of this. If you are thinking that you may not actually wake up the next morning, you don't want to have left two cents behind. So... Um, I think that's the same, you know, same kind of thing. And, and also because I think it's, real, it's realistic, isn't it? It's, it's a fact. I mean, that doesn't sort of a knock on the door. It doesn't come whenever you want, but you can literally die tomorrow. You know, you could die in your sleep. And then, so why not contemplate that, that idea? Yeah, I'm, I think it's a beautiful um, technique. Thanks, Tony. Anyone else want to? Rosa had her hand up. Oh, so yeah, yeah. Thanks, Paul. Yes. yes. Um, yeah. I would like just because when you were when you were um, uh, reading the quotes uh, on Seneca uh, of anger, yeah. and it, that that it says supposed you know that uh, whatever it angers you is a disease of a misfortune. Um, it will take less effect upon you if you wear it quietly. Yeah. Um, I mean, the only thing that, I mean, when you read it, it came to mind that, um, I mean, to bear quietly, a, you know, if you have a disease or an illness is, you know, to, to be angry is one thing and to be quite quiet about this is another thing. I mean, I think in a sense, uh, you can talk about it, uh, about your feelings and about, and that can be very, very helpful without being angry. Um, so oh, yeah, that is the yeah. thing. So, I mean, I, I suppose that and Seneca in that, in that quote. Yeah, sorry, Rosa, I don't mean that he's, he's, he's saying here that he's saying that, that he sh you shouldn't talk about your disease at all, but rather they shouldn't be uh, angry about it purely because you know this negative emotion is not going to do anything for you it's just going to make things worse uh, isn't it yeah yes yes um so so yes so, i mean i think that in that sense he's quite right of in you know in saying you know to quiet any any negative perception or any anger yeah. um um but yeah so i mean it's just it just you know it came to mind because um, I mean, sometimes people may get very angry about any illness uh, that they may suffer, and they will say, why me, and why me, and why me? And normally, people will see things happening to others, but will never think about themselves um, suffering an illness. And then, um, and then when, you know, when people get it, an illness, they, they say, why me? Well, we are humans, and we are you know, we suffer illnesses, so... Um, why, why, is, why not, why uh, not you, right? Yeah, yeah, that, I mean, that you, is you my could, point, why know, not you? You, you could so, ask yourself, why yeah. not me? Yeah, yeah, so, so yes, yeah, so, I mean, I think that anger, the only thing that it does is exacerbate or make things worse. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I, I quite agree with him in, you know, in putting anger off the scenario of being quiet about anger but um yes and um, i think it's good to talk about all the feelings that yeah. the person may have yeah i just wanted did, to make that note. did you yeah. did you know that metaphor uh, i think it's good i'm not too sure whether it's put this actually the two arrows where the first arrow is the pain and the second arrow is the uh, suffering and the first arrow is yes, uh, yes. yeah inevitable because you know you kind of but the suffering you can uh, avoid it 
but by you not know, getting caught into the narrative of, you know, why me and I can't bear this and this is too much, when is this gonna end, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, I mean, it is all about perception and about how we perceive a, a certain event or how we perceive any, any, anything in life. So yes, uh, I, I mean, I agree completely with that, yeah. Thanks, Rosa. Muchas gracias. Thank you. De nada. Fabio. Yes, uh, thank you very much for your effort and presentation. Really, it's very nice. Thank uh, you. I think in agreement with the others, I mean, uh, I think um, this presentation is not really shocking. The stoic, like Aurelius, uh, quotes are not really, I think, shocking. They are reality as it is. But I think we are always having this sense of entitlement that life owes us that, you know, it's transferred from the parents, you know, we had it from the parents, and then we transfer it to life, like life owes us something, uh, which is basically a fiction, uh, we create it in our minds, and then we suffer because we reality doesn't care about us, basically. And uh, this is a call anyway to kind of wake up to the reality of what it is as it is in, in real it's not uh, yeah. yeah talking about father just want to stop you there because i'm just um uh, i just want to add something to it uh, talking about reality and fantasies i do have the feeling for example that with my friends who are sort of healthy um they've got this perception somehow i guess that, that they're going to live forever whereas mm. somebody who's you know, has got a chronic condition, is more aware that, you know, that you could, you know, die any moment or that life can be shorter. So I just, yeah. yeah. No. We also deny it. We don't want to face the reality as it is, isn't it? It's too hard and too harsh to bear sometimes that really, you know, anything can happen to us any moment and nothing's going to last. Uh, everything is transient. So all this loves and, you know, it's passing. Uh, so, you know, the reality of, is so hard that we try to create our own imaginary, more tolerable world. And then we shoot when it doesn't work like that. Well, people sometimes put their heads in the sand, isn't it? I yeah. was, um, I remember when, uh, what's his name? Boris Johnson said uh, that phrase, I can't remember the exact words, but I think he said, I must be even with you. Uh, you know, uh, your, your love, uh, what was the word? Your elder, the elderly people are gonna die. Um, I follow a lot the Italian sort of, um, you know, uh, news and stuff. And that phrase was, um, I found it was a misinterpreted, you know. He, uh, he came across for a lot of people as being callous, you know, he didn't care about the other people. For me, he was just making a realistic assessment of the situation. He said, we're going to have a disease. Uh, this disease, unfortunately, maybe, you know, um, it's going to affect people who are immunocompromised and the elderly who've got comorbidities, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's a, to, to, I saw in that again, yet again, a rejection of the reality, you know, just yes, well, like yeah. you're talking about, you know, this, you know, so. The whole media and society promotes this kind of thinking uh, that, you know, uh, we're entitled, we have rights, we, you know, life owes us, all that. You know, it makes money, it makes us slaves in the end, unfortunately. Thanks, Ali. Paul. Yeah, hi. Th thanks, Carmelo. Um, I was just thinking to follow on from the conversation you're just having. Um, a lot of the stoic um, concepts led into uh, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, where we might adjust the kind of phrases we have in our head about maybe illness or symptoms that we're suffering with. And I just wonder, there's there's sometimes, I don't know what your experience, Carmelo, is, but sometimes that doesn't work very well when you interface with the medical profession. So if, there's, if you're in pain and you, you go and see your doctor and you say, well, it's nothing to me, you're not going to get any treatment for your pain. So you suddenly have to adjust um, 
your phrasing and the, all the cognitive training you might have done, it's inappropriate when you're in a medical context because you actually have to give them the language that they're used to in a way to describe symptoms and pain. Oh yeah, no, I get what you're saying, but can I yeah. just say that uh, going back to this, this um, the Stoics, or I don't know about this, but actually it's, it's uh, Donald Robinson that coined this uh, expression, objective representation. Um, I don't know what it's called in the literature or, or if there was a name at all. This idea that you make an assessment of the situation without adding onto it. Uh, so that's so when you're with a medical professional, you can still say, you know, I've got this. In fact, they try and get you to, you know, be quite precise about the nature of the pain, the duration, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but what I was talking about is the this uh, adding a value judgment onto it and saying, you know, I can't bear this, this is too much. Uh, can you unmute yourself, Tommaso? I, I could do that for you. Hang on. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, just a simple question. Um, uh, changing the attitude, not uh, the relation between myself and disease, but the disease of somebody that you love and you are beside too. And uh, that's a, a very um, word and different situation. How do you feel? How do you, um, what is your attitude before this situation? Hmm. I guess, uh, you know about the dichotomy of control. That's such a useful concept for, you know, for, uh, anything that you do in life. Uh, um, I find it great. So, for example, if you got somebody who a loved one who's got a disease, then you can ask yourself what is under my control and what is not under my control. The fact that your loved one has a disease, she or he already got it, so that's not under your control. Uh, whether they're going to get worse, that's beyond your control. Um, whether they're going to uh, suffer physical pain, that's not under your control. But what is under your control is what you, you know, what you can do for this person, I guess. So can you be as helpful as you can be, uh, as reassuring as you can be? That, that's the way I would uh, frame it. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Thomas. Anyone else? I don't know who France is. Uh, I must have joined at a later stage. Well, I, Paul, uh, sorry, David. I don't think it's, I realize how um, radical this dichotomy of control thing is actually. Not about the things that are not under your control, but many people think that nothing is under their control at all. So that um, this is why we have things like microaggressions. So if you ask someone an innocent seeming question, for example, then you can be heavily criticized for that because you hadn't foreseen that um, the person would be upset or offended by it. So um, those kinds of people, which seems to must be about 25% of the under 25s at the moment in the universities in particular, are so um, fragile that nothing at all is under their control. So words, you have to be careful about every word that you say and this, because it may have been added to the list of offensive words this week. So um, these are the people, of course, who are in dire need of being stoic and um, are never going to get there because Epictetus would never be allowed to speak in any English speaking university. I don't know about Italian ones, maybe they're different, but um, you know, he really pushes it to the kids, doesn't he, his students. He tells them to man up essentially. 
Can you imagine doing that in, uh, you know, Oxford or UCL or Harvard, telling the kids to man up? I'm going to say, man up, man, man up is not very PC. Yeah, exactly. So that's why Epic Teeth. <laughs> but I mean it. <laughs> Would he? Paul, were you going to say something? <laughs> Yeah, well, we should have um, a separate meeting for that, Terry. <laughs> Need to get some under 25s to participate. Then we would see something interesting, maybe. Yeah, it's, um, it's con oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go on, seeing as you thought I was going to say something, I'll chip in. Um, just to pick up on this question Terry's raised about um, how strictly uh, we understand the concept of what's under our control. So you, when you were answering uh, Tommaso's question, you kind of gave the impression that we might be able to do something to help someone we love who's ill. But the, the strict stoic interpretation is probably that even our actions are um, incorporated in their concept of fate. So actually, the only part that is truly under our control is, is our judgment of events as they unfold. Um, so the, the actions that we might do to help are probably not. They're probably conditioned by all sorts of things before we make, make those actions, and they're not really um, under our control. I think I've understood what you said. <laughs> but not too sure. So, <laughs> so to, to give you an example, say 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 that your your child is sick. Yeah. Um, there might be some actions that you take, like calling the doctor regularly, taking their temperature, giving them nourishing food. But under the stoic idea of fate, those things are already predestined. And they're not, strictly speaking, under your control, even though you appear to be doing them. Um, whereas there are other things that are occurring during a scenario like that where you might feel fearful, you might uh, be angry about your child being ill, and those things are under your control. But wouldn't that be equally not under your control? They, they would be equally predestined, wouldn't they? No, not, not, not if they're well, internal states. So it's only the internal states that we're working on if we're strictly following that dichotomy of control. Mm. My brain is human a little bit. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I get what you think. There we yeah, I don't think that's right, actually. But um, every philosophy has a problem of determinism and freedom. Uh, the Stoics, not uniquely. So, um, and do you know about the cylinder thing, Paul? That um, <laughs> the bit that's under your control is the, it rolls down the hill of its, um, being pushed in the circular direction, it doesn't move at all of it, it's being pushed in the other direction. So that's how they dealt with it. But um, yeah, so the thing is, one has to be careful with this because it results in people saying, well, I don't actually need to bother doing anything because it's already predetermined. So why should I get up in the morning? You know? Yeah, can I stop you there? So what would you, what do you reply to that, Paul? That seems to me like a, a an understandable objection. No, but that, that was called the lazy argument. Um, right. That the, the idea is if you're pursuing virtue, you wouldn't take that approach. So you're still, um, you're still aiming to help people, but those, the way that you help and the circumstances that allow you to help are only, um, they're a mixture of things that you're doing that mix up with the circumstances. So they're not fully under your control. So in that dichotomy that we're talking about, the things that you really want to be working on are your, are your inner state whilst you carry on doing them, whilst you carry on trying to help your sick child. Um, 
So that's, I think, um, you know, the objection that people hear about Stoic theory of fate and then throw up their hands and say, well, I needn't do anything. That means they're not fully understanding how the things that they do as a person mix into causation. It doesn't mean you stop doing those things. It just means that you shift your attention to your inner state whilst continuing to do them. So you continue trying to feed your child, you continue taking their temperature, you continue looking for medical help, but your attention is, is focused on your inner state. Are you um, continuing to think about uh, whether you're remaining virtuous, remaining calm under the circumstances, um, you know, acting wisely, being prudent, those kinds of issues will be where most of your attention is. Uh, whilst you do all the other things, just in a way, naturally, you would naturally look after your child. Thank you. Uh, we got any other comments, questions? No, well, I guess we can call it today. Um, so thank you all very much for coming. The next meeting is going to be on the 29th of November, as I said. Uh, at the end of the month, it's going to be a Sunday, 4 p.m. I'm going to have Gabriele Galluzzo, who's a professor, uh, sorry, lecturer of ancient philosophy at the University of Exeter, and he's also one of the uh, members of the modern stoicism team. Great. Thank you all very much for coming and have a, uh, well, a nice day or whatever is uh, left of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Rosa. Thanks, Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye, Tommaso. Ciao. Ciao. <laughs> Ciao.